All right. Hello, everyone who is watching us live and here with us on Zoom. My name is Noel, and I'm here with Father Gary Kiriakou for our weekly Tuesday program, Armed with Faith. If you're joining us on our social media and YouTube and Facebook, you can leave your questions and comments throughout the program. Um, and if you're here with us on Zoom, you can also leave your comments in the chat feature. We will be recording this program as well as streaming it live. It'll be available as a recording on our social media sites, and it will also be available at myocn.net. You can also visit YouTube, Facebook, or myocn.net to see the past episodes of Armed with Faith. The Orthodox Christian Network is a 501c3 corporation and a 100% donor-supported ministry. In 2021, we offered 280 programs in addition to articles, live radio, live streaming worship. Um, in 2021, we saw a statistic that said that 65% of Americans are viewing some kind of worship online. So people are really engaging with their faith online. And we want to keep these programs free and available. So we thank you to all of you who support us financially and also who support us by engaging with our content, sharing with your friends and family. And we really appreciate all of you for being here today. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Father Gary for our interview. Hey, thank you, Noel. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Noel, for holding on the fort while I was away. We, uh, we uh, messed around with some uh, recorded shows and we're back live today. I'm, I'm back uh, in the saddle. And I'm here with a good friend, uh, Valerie Yarrow uh, Pappas, uh, who I kind of grew up with. We uh, go way back to our childhood days at the Cathedral in Los Angeles and have a lot of similar uh, likes in uh, our hobbies and the things that we do and uh, have reconnected in these last few years since uh, our kids have grown. We, have, uh, we both have daughters named Elena who are just about what, like three weeks apart in age, which is really kind of cool. So Valerie, thank you for being here. Really, really appreciate it. Your time is precious and valuable. And I'm just really grateful that you were able to carve this hour out and be with us here. How are you? I'm doing well. Good to be here, Father Gary. And so fun to see how your faith and spirituality and what all the goodness you're spreading around the world. So Good to see you, and we're we're all rooting for you. I'm very excited for your uh, endeavors. Awesome. You know, I can make it official here. Um, I can tell everybody that you are the marketing person behind Armed with Faith. You're the one that that uh, told me to switch it, and uh, you brought Armed with Faith to me. So I have you to thank for the title of the show. So I really appreciate that. And um, it was called something different before, and you told me that nobody would know what we're talking about. And so here <laughs> we are. Uh, this is the 33rd show. Is that right, Noel? Um, I'm actually not sure, but we've something, been doing it. Something so. like that. I just, I, I yeah. saw, st I, you were saying statistics and I was thinking about it. So we've done quite a few shows and, and so I'm really thrilled that we're here. Um, Valerie, uh, one of the, th one of the topics that I really want to talk to you about, um, was something that we were talking about just before uh, we went live on the air, but that was, that's COVID and the way that it's affected our kids and how it's, um, penetrated itself into the lives of our children these last couple of years. One of the things that you just told me was, I, I hope you don't mind me bringing it up, um, but your daughter, your daughter tested positive for COVID, um, asymptomatic now, but still uh, has to stay home. And so she's missing out on even more things at school. How's that, how's that affecting you as a parent watching that? Well, it's really, you know, hard to explain. So she tested positive, you know, a week ago. She had a slight cold for just a few days. She felt fine by the weekend. Uh, according to LA County and, you know, guidelines, we have to test her, um, at a, you know, at an urgent care facility. She has, she can't go back to school and she's until she's got a negative result. Um, but of course, you know, they were telling, you know, th this can stay, these vi this virus and these particles can stay in your body for up to even 90 days. So she could keep testing positive. Now, LA County is saying after 10 days, you can go back to school um, without being tested. But now she's missed 10 days worth of school. Um, she feels completely fine. Yesterday we had her fourth COVID test that was still unfortunately positive. And I'm trying to explain to this 13 year old why she can't be in this class if she feels completely fine. <laughs> she's jump, running circles around my house. She's, you know, she's baking, she's outside playing volleyball. She's, why can't I go to, I'm missing all these, she's deb, she's a girl on top of it. She's hormonal, she's like crying and I'm missing all these great things. And she's explained why. And it's like, and she knows we have cut, we were just in Florida for two weeks. 
They're not even testing over there. You know, there's schools and private schools here that aren't even testing as well. So it's just, there's inconsistency as we know. I'm not preaching to the choir. Everybody understands this. It's very frustrating and it's hard. You know, yeah, it's, it's it, just- it, it, it is. It's, it's hard to watch our kids go through that. And that's what I was, I was getting at. Like we're seeing, we're seeing our kids miss out on so many things that, that we kind of took for granted, right? Like eighth grade, you, yeah. you, would, you would think that nothing really special, but there's little things. You said there's the, there's the uh, special week with a, with a theme going on yeah. for her that she's missing out on. Yeah. And um, I just feel for our kids. How do you get, how do you coach her through it? How do you get her past it? How are you like today's Tuesday, um, somebody might be listening to this another time, but today's Tuesday. You said she can't go back till Monday. So she's going to miss another three days of yeah. school. Yeah. Uh, well, n- number one, you know, I, I, first of all, I, it's all about, listen, I mean, the technicality is okay. Reach out to your teachers, try to find out what you're missing. It's, you know, but, but I'm, but the more important thing I'm trying to work with her on last night, and she was getting very frustrated with me because she's very young and doesn't understand is perspective. And, you know, this is really a blip in her life that she, you know, I'm sure she'll remember COVID days, but, you know, missing these days of school. Yeah. Is it, is it tragic for a 13 year old with, you know, who has very little life experience? Absolutely. Um, But I'm trying to gain perspective. And the other thing I said to her is, listen, you know, as far as practicing gratitude, you know, we're, we're not, you're not sitting in a hospital bed right now. This is not, you know, we didn't just get a diagnosis of something that is horrific. You know, we didn't just find out you had some horrible disease. You are overcoming a virus. It's no big deal. You feel great. And let's focus on that. You know, let's focus on this time. And what can you do to make this time count? You know, you're not going to just sit and watch TV all day. You're not going to be on your phone because your friends are in class. So let's, what can you do? Can you paint? Can you do art? Can you, you know, get back on the piano? You know, things like that. It's so funny how you say um, you're only 13, you're only in eighth grade. You could take it in perspective. And I like the gratitude avenue that you took as well. When we think about our lives being 13 versus now, you know, pushing late 40, early 50s as, as we, you know, kind of get older. I remember when my grandmother turned 50 and here we are, right? And so you, you think that 13 years ago was nothing for us, um, but 13 years is a huge chunk of their lives and, and the things that we went through and what they're going through. These kids are really put under a lot of pressure and, and stress and um, thrilled to see that you're getting her to look at it in perspective with uh, some gratitude as well. And the, uh, the hospital bed is a great way to put it also. Um, what are some of the other challenges that you face as a parent of a teenage girl? Let's start, let's keep, let's stay around that for now. Not the COVID issue, but just a, a teenage girl raising her in the Orthodox church, taking her to church, being part of, uh, you know, the community here in Southern California. What are some of the difficulties that you're finding in raising your daughter um, as a teenager in the Orthodox church? Well, first of all, let's talk about the, the underlying thing that's rampant across the, the world, especially mostly first world countries of all teenagers, especially teenage girls, is anxiety. Um, anxiety is absolutely through the roof and out of control across the board, out of control. And um, people are lining up, at, you know, they're, they're rushing, you know, emergency rooms and hospitals as adults because... Uh, they're having, of course, that will manifest as, you know, anxiety starts as a young person and then it just manifests as you become older. And then, it, you know, you have the heart palpitations, you've got the, I can't breathe. You've got all these symptoms that show up and you're convinced you, you have an illness and you rush to the ER and, and truly all your medical, you know, your blood work, everything's fine. It's truly suffering from anxiety. And most people are in complete denial about it because that's just their baseline. Um, so it starts now. And I'll tell you, the biggest problem with raising kids today is, you know, it's electronics, it's, it's cell phones that are, yes, it is what an incredible invention they are, but it is the downfall of society and social media is truly, um, I, I got to tell you, I went, I got off of it a year and a half ago. Best thing I ever did. Off and, of social media? Off of yes. your social media? Yeah, I, I, I do. I do it for the foundation. You know, of course, that's okay. the way to reach people. But um, 
social media is just the downfall of society. There, there's really nothing good that that comes out of. Um, well, you, you, know, you sparked you sparked my curiosity now, like like about social media because you're you're marketing, like that's I what know. you do, and like that's that's your well, bread and butter. We're being marketing. We're being marketed to death, by the way. And I'm, you know, okay. I, I'm a marketer, but we are being marketed to death. And that started, that started probably 20 years ago where you can't even be in the grocery store and the little, the little dividers in the grocery store when you're uh-huh. checking out, we're being, you know, that's branded. Um, you know, we're marketed to death. And that, that was, and then, you know, remember when we used to watch television when there was just a few channels, but remember, remember like in the, when there were, before the bug was in the corner of, you know, before the network had their bug, their gigantic, like NBC bug in the right hand corner. Remember, remember the days when we didn't have bugs in the corner, we were just watching TV. Now we're marketed to death while we're watching the network. Yes. I know I'm watching NBC. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're marketed to death and social media is a great platform for marketing, of course. And it works. Have I ever bought anything? Of course. Yeah. I've seen something on, you know, back in the day on Instagram. Oh, that looks cool. But the problem is what's happening is back in our day in the eight, growing up in the eighties and the nineties. Yeah. There were bullies there have been bullies around, you know, from day one. And the problem is the bullies now can follow you home. The bullies left, ended at school. When in our day, you went home at three o'clock, that bully was out of your head until the next day you saw that person. Well, now we are being infiltrated and we are being, you know, um, followed 24 seven. And the problem is, and, you know, if, if people haven't been seen the social network on Netflix, everyone needs to watch that show. Um, the social network on Netflix will scare the heck out of anybody that's <laughs> on social media because we are being completely used and manipulated. I'm going to attest to that because you suggested that I watch it, watched it with my daughter. And after about 30 minutes of it, she couldn't take it anymore. And she was like, is this really happening? And I said, yes, it is. And we both had to turn it off and take a little bit of a break. Um, I don't even think she finished it, but yeah, great yeah. show. Great yeah. show it's to watch. Eye opening. It's frightening. And everyone should pay attention and understand uh, everything they're doing and that they're being manipulated. But anyway, going back to parenting, so we can't get, you know, the phones are here to stay. They're not going away. Social media is not going away. So what do we do as parents? Well, we have to monitor that. We have to manage that. We have to have boundaries. And boundaries is um, an enormous, it's a really big word that it means so many things that is without boundaries, it's just a world of chaos. And we have got to create boundaries. And it's, is it easy? Absolutely not. Is it easy to put the cat back in the bag? Once your kid, if your kid, your teen, which is so common today, is used to being in their room all night with a cell phone, texting their friends two, three o'clock in the morning, they sleep just a few hours, they wake up, they're falling asleep in class. How do you put that cat back in the bag? No. And I have friends who say to me, um, Oh my God, I can't take their phone away. It, it would be World War III. Well, then yep. bring on World War III is what I say. Good for you. <laughs> bring it Good on. For you. Because uh, you you let it get that far. That's your fault. And now you've got it. And, and by the way, it's, it's not punishing. It's explaining to these kids what this does. And the more time they spend, and I, and I tell Elena, my daughter, because they, th- these girls are just, and, and listen, I monitor, I see what they're saying. It's nonsense. Is, is anything dangerous happening? No. Are they bullying? They're not. But you know what it is? It's a waste of time. Mm-hmm. And I try to explain in our day, we come home from school, we do our homework. If I wanted to talk to my girlfriend, I would get on the phone. We had one phone in our home. I would get on that <laughs> one phone and I would pick it up and I would have to call my friends home. And I don't know who would answer. It might be Mrs. Jones. It might be Mr. Jones. It might be the big brother. And I'd have to use my speaking skills at 13 and say, hello, Mrs. Jones. This is Valerie. Could I please speak to Susie? And I'd have to use my skills. These kids don't even know what that means. You're absolutely right. You know, I I have a funny story and I can really tell it real quick because uh, everybody on here, except for a few people, know uh, Father Bill Tragus. And uh, back uh, when we were making phone calls like that, and I was working with Father Bill Tragus before we were both clergy, he had called me um, at my father-in-law's house, and uh, my father-in-law answered the phone, and I heard my father-in-law go, no, who's this? 
And then they both started laughing. And it turns out that Father Bill and called and my father-in-law said, hello. And Father Bill's response was, who's this? And my father-in-law said, no, who's this? Because that's not how you answer a phone, right? And so it was, it was, it was comedic in the sense that um, you do that. But you're right. Today, we don't have to talk to Mr. and Mrs. Pappas. We don't have to talk to Mr. and Mrs. Skaggs or, or, no. or Father, Father Sotiri if we don't really want to, right? We're, we're, we're at the point where um, I can get a message to you by text. I don't even need to talk to you if I don't want to, right? I can just no. text you. And there's not even a conversation that needs to be had. No. And so um, these kids aren't learning how to communicate. They're not learning. Now, and, and now how do we do it? We have to show by example. We have to force them to. Now, boys are worse than girls. Boys, and I, I test, my son is not a, a speaker. You say, hey, how you doing? Fine. Good. Nothing. I mean, you know, I, okay. Elaborate what, you know, th these kids don't know. I'll say to them, you know what? You want to call, find out what time the store closes. You mean I have to call them? Yeah, pick up the phone, dial the number. You're going to talk to a stranger. What What do I say? I mean, you know, it's it's just that we have like, kids don't even understand that is frightening. So it, meanwhile, it really is, and and they're staying they're staying younger longer because of okay. it, right? Like like the 26 these days is is gonna is like 17 yeah. back 25 years ago, and it's just really weird how our kids are developing. Um, I, as, as I'm going through this and, and working a lot more with youth now than ever before with the, the two new roles that I have in the church, I'm realizing that really it's our fault uh, as parents, right? Like, like we gave them the phones, we gave them the technology, we didn't put boundaries around it. And I like the boundaries that you set. Can I press you and ask you, what are some of the boundaries that you use in your home as a parent well, for social media, for technology, for those sort of things? Well, when, when we bought my daughter a phone, um, which I really was opposed to. And that was a, between my husband and I, I'm not going to throw him under the bus, but he wanted her. Okay, whatever. We got the phone. <laughs> um, everyone loves George. So anyway, we, I, um, I, a friend of mine gave me a contract that uh, to use that uh, she used on her daughter. It was fabulous. It is a one page contract. It, it states things like this phone we own this phone, this phone, you are borrowing it. We pay for it. We own it. We take it back whenever we feel like it. If we feel like it is being abused, if we ever call you on that phone and you do not answer, the phone is gone. If you are on your phone and we ask you a question and you don't look up and answer us, the phone is gone. If you lose the phone, there's no more phone, but buy phone until you can buy your own phone. Um, and there's rules at night, you know, I, we allow her, uh, on, on the, that phone has to get turned into the kitchen. It charges in our kitchen. That phone is never allowed overnight in the bedrooms. Um, there's no reason for it. Um, that, that, you know, I check it all the time. I say to her, I have full access to that phone. Anytime I feel like it, I check all the texts. You are not allowed to be on Instagram or Facebook um, she does have Snapchat, you know, my kids have Snapchat. I look at, uh, you know, the things go away on Snapchat, but I know her friends. And then we have a very tight parent network. And that's another huge part of raising kids today. I was going to say that it takes a village, right? And it so takes it a village. Takes, yeah. yeah. And you, you got to know your kids' friends really well. You got to know their parents. You got to know, um, we're lucky. We go to a really small Catholic school. We're really, really blessed. People that go to public schools don't have the same kind of community, but you know, you can make it. You and you know, your kids are, they say you are who you hang around. So, you know, make sure you you know the kind of kids your kids are hanging around and where they're going and what they're doing. Um when you say that my grandmother, my grandmother used to say, show me your friends and I'll and I'll explain to you your character. It sounds yeah. a lot more romantic in Greek than it does in English, but. That's, that's what you said, right? Like, uh, you, yeah. that's how you define a person by their friends, right? Exactly. Right. Um, and, you know, make sure they're all kind of like-minded. Um, so, you know, in a lot of communication, of course, with these kids, they have to understand um, what can happen on social media and the trolling and all the, you know, the really scary stuff that can go on on uh, this TikTok thing. You know, TikTok, listen, it, they can watch it and all that, but, you know, they've got, it goes out of control. These friend, these people, the problem is we're in a world of, likes 
we are in the world now of getting, you know, trying to go after likes. And that, of course, going back to anxiety, um, <clears throat> that is causing a tremendous, tremendous issue with teens. And it is, um, it is, you know, these kids are basing their entire value system on likes by strangers. And they're also basing, you know, they're getting crushed emotionally if they're not getting likes. And, you know, and the other thing is, aside from the likes, getting validation from total strangers and people, it's seeing, it's all this fear of missing out nonsense. And adults are guilty of this entire thing as well. You know, back in the day, our old days, you know, someone threw a party and you weren't invited, you didn't know about it till the next week. Well, now it's instantaneous. You're sitting yeah. there going, oh my God, I wasn't invited. They're partying right now. No wonder she didn't yeah. call me back. Yeah. Um, you know, so yeah. this is terrible. I mean, this is, yeah. none of this is good. I don't know. I don't know how we're going to climb out of it um, in, in, in the sense <clears throat> of going back to normal. Uh, kind of a, a thought that I have, like a, like a dream that I have is that um, the world turn off the internet one day a week, right? Like we just, we just, everybody just flick a switch. And like on Sundays, we just have no internet. Um, you can watch your NFL, like you can watch your football, you can watch your soccer, or basketball, but then everything else is, there's, there's no, no other access to anything. That's never going to happen. And we're going to have to learn how to deal with this. It's going to get even worse as we go mm-hmm. along. You know, um, uh, I know that uh, uh, I was talking to a friend who said that he tested his phone and he didn't, Put, he didn't do anything but, but put his phone on his TV and turned his TV to a Korean speaking channel all night long. And it was speaking Korean all night long. He's, you know, a white guy, no ethnicity in, in any case. The next day, he, his Facebook feed w- was, was lit up with uh, advertisements of, with Korean products, right? And uh, you, you wouldn't think otherwise. And so they really are watching. They really are uh, paying attention, they're 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 marketing us. They're pushing us in different directions and things like that. Your kind of marketing that you're into, though, is not that kind of marketing. What what kind of marketing uh, you do? Uh, you're in feature film marketing, well, right? Yeah, I'm not in marketing anymore. I what? That's my. Oh, I'm pet. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I did I did film promotional marketing for a long time, and then I went into product placement. So I was just okay. working in production, and now I work um, freelance in production as well. So yeah. So you were you were just can we talk about the show that you just finished is it is it okay i mean i don't want to yeah. yeah. i don't know if there's like any uh, things that we're we're going to give away but you just finished a show with jim belushi who i'm a big fan of and um he is an orthodox christian and there's a a, a common priest that he and i both know and um you were talking about uh, we were talking about his brother's death and and you were getting into it a little bit with him about how it really affected him how do you think that as our kids grow, and, and God forbid anything like that happened to our families, but how do you think that our kids would react today to a tragedy like that, like a John Belushi type of a tragedy, a Kurt Cobain kind of a tragedy, with the emotional stability that our kids deal with today? How do you think that we have the, we're giving them the social skills to deal with challenges like that, like losing somebody at an inappropriate time, at an well, unfortunate time? Well, you're talking about adversity and you're talking about loss and, and you know, really adversity. Um, <clears throat> the problem is, you know, we are creating, um, unfortunately, we're creating a very weak society um, today by um, all this political correctness that's going on. And um, it, it unfortunately is, is, you know, the everyone, you know, the offenses and you can't say this and you can't do that. You can't put this there and you can't call that and you can't. You know, so what that's doing is just creating a lot of a box around everybody in a bubble. So what happens is when something happens in life, adversity comes, which it will, everyone will face a trial, everyone gets a turn. Um, That's the way life works. Um, There's just, there's no, they're not equipped and there's no coping skills. So what do we do? We turn to external factors. We turn to, you know, drinking or drugs or, um, you know, sex or whatever it is like we we just turn at social media oh my gosh i have to dive myself into instagram to to connect with friends i have to connect to the external world um so and you know with with john's death you know jim of course uh, you know he kind of fell into you know uh addiction as well and uh which is that's what most people do it's very common um why because uh we are not 
don't have a foundation. We don't turn to God. We don't, we are constantly looking outside of us. We don't go internal. <clears throat> and what did this pandemic teach us? It was a gigantic awakening and it was an absolute shift. Um, and a lot of people got it. A lot of people, there was a lot of people that did, and I'm one of them that actually um, went inward during this time and thrived, um, you know, and really uh, discovered a lot about myself and what I can do and accomplish and, and all that. And I really got close, closer to God. So you, what happened? You really did. You, you really did. And, and, and the conversation that we've had and, and, and your spirituality and the way that you've done it, you've got a, a, adversity is a huge word and that I would use to describe a, 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 your life and the things that you've gone through. And so I want to pause right there, but I want to say that adversity is where we're going to come back at. I want to see if Noel, if there are any questions online or anything before we move on to um, this question, next question that I have for Valerie and, and the direction we will go with with adversity. Uh, go ahead with your questions, Father Gary. Okay. Um, let me know if there's any questions online or if anybody has any, and feel free to ask anybody uh, here that's with us here live. Go ahead and raise your hand. You can ask a question as well. But Valerie, um, yeah, I've noticed that you're right, that people deal with adversity a whole lot differently. And, and uh, the, the, the pandemic really kind of drove people into a place of either um, hiding or discovery, right? And you and I have talked about that discovery part of it. Um, but be, even before the pandemic, your family hit adversity. You, you, you hit, you hit a, 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 your life kind of took, I, I, I kind of just imagine like, remember the old records we used to have and when they used to scratch and go, I kind of imagine that's what happened to you guys in your life when all that happened with, uh, with Alex. And we don't need to get too deep into it as much as you want, but, we, but, but there, there came a day where you realized that your son Alex wasn't functioning as other kids his age were functioning. His walking got difficult. And he was diagnosed with. He was, was diagnosed, diagnosed with, at five years old. He was diagnosed. We we uh, diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Right, and what does that mean exactly? <clears throat> and Duchenne is a progressive muscle wasting disease that happens only in boys, um, and it it's progressive. It affects every muscle in the body, including the heart and the lungs. Um, they basically get diagnosed between three and five. They stop walking around 12 and, um, there is yet to be a cure. There, uh, has not been a survivor yet. And, um, upon diagnosis, you're basically given a, I hate saying it, but they, you know, it's given a death sentence. I mean, they basically, sorry, I'm sorry you have to say that. I'm yeah, that's okay. They, 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 I, I, I'm going to say it because I don't attach to it. And I know that that's not his outcome or his journey. Good. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's what, you know, that's, that's what you're being told. Now there's lots of exciting clinical trials starting up and, and, uh, a lot of hope right now, but, uh, no. So at that time, this was 2011 <clears throat> and, uh, our life was on a awesome trajectory. You know, we had two healthy kids and my, you know, I was, I had just, uh, take, I had just left Paramount Pictures because just to take a little bit of time off because I had two, you know, my daughter was one and Alex was three or four. And, um, you know, I want to take a little time off freelance and then go back to work. And during that time is when, um, the diagnosis came and it was a, a process. So it was, it floored us. It leveled us. It was, uh, I, you know, I, the only way I kind of describe the feeling is in sitting in that room in UCLA hospital, getting that diagnosis. It was literally like this surreal out of body experience where I ended up looking around the room, literally physically looking around the room going, I'm going to crawl into the closest crack to get out of here because I am done. I am out. I've had a nice life so far, but I'm not doing this. This is, I'm done. I'm out. Um, so I went from that to um, calling Father John Backus. He was my third, our third phone call after our parents. And ironically, there was, well, not ironically, by divine connection, there was a very holy man in town. <clears throat> uh, named Father Pavlos from St. Um, Cath Catherine's in Mount yeah, Sinai. In, in Mount Sinai, right? Mount Sinai, who happened to be in town. <laughs> and we went that Sunday, brought our son, and he gave him amazing holy prayers. Jesus was with him. He said to us, he uh, said, put oil on him. He said, prayers, your son is, 
your son is, uh, Jesus is with him and he's going to be okay and never lose faith. And it was just this very, very powerful day. And I will tell you from that day forward, um, it gave us a, it, for me personally, it gave me a, a absolute um, peace that just surpassed all understanding, which is talked about. And I love hearing you. I love hearing you say that, that piece that, that surpasses all understanding because we can't, I, I can see it in you. Um, I can't imagine the turmoil that you felt or that you still feel. And then you turn to God in that and find that peace. I want to um, just real quick. There's a story in the gospels where uh, Christ and the disciples encounter a blind man and the disciples turn to Christ and say, who sinned the blind man or his parents for him to have been born this way. Right. And Christ looks at the disciples and says, neither, um, he was born this way to glorify God. And I want to say that um, you have taken your adversity of Alex's um, diagnosis, and you've turned it into a tremendous blessing for other people who have children, who have sons that uh, suffer from the same disease, right? Can you tell us a little bit about what you did, like what, and what you did and what you're doing, um, and, and talk about walking strong a little bit? Yeah, so I mean, what we basically did after that, after picking up the pieces a couple of years, we started a foundation called Walking Strong. And um, it, it basically is a charitable foundation. We do a big, amazing gala once a year to raise money. And we have an assistance program where we help uh, families from all over the country with their medical device needs because insurance actually does not pay for quite a bit of things that you would absolutely be shocked about. <clears throat> um, and uh, every time, you know, when a boy goes into a power wheelchair, they need a handicap accessible van and most people can't afford to go out and buy a new car and they can't afford to remodel their bathrooms and put in ramps and do all these things. And it just comes at you like a Mack truck. And um, we started the foundation. We have an incredible, we've raised in, we started in 2014, the end. Our first fundraiser was 2015 and we've raised to date over a million dollars. And um, we've helped a lot of families with not only their needs, we also have a mental wellness expert who coaches people um, for free. We have, uh, and that's a regular ongoing um, coach that they each get, whoever wants the mom, the dad, the, 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 the person with the diagnosis, whatever. And we've also given about a half a million dollars to scientific research at UCLA and nationwide children's in Columbus. So Really exciting work, but I'll tell you, um, going back to adversity, yeah, what to teach these kids and people today is, you know, like I said, we're all going to have trials. We were never promised a life without trials. We know that, but, and that's the Bible talks about that, but what we, what we have to do is the question is once that trial comes, what is the meaning of it? Putting the meaning behind that trial and because everything comes for a reason. And, you know, God doesn't promise that, you know, that we're not going to have issues, right? But God promises joy in the morning that he will bring us through the trial and through the fire. And that is 1000% true. And is it, you know, is it hard? Do I have hard days? And, and uh, absolutely. But, you know, serving others, I can't even tell you, it, you, it, it just dissipates your, 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 anxiety, your, 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 um, grief, you know, and, um, to, you know, we all really the, to serve others is what, is what this is all about. So back to kids and their anxiety, well, getting those kids out of their heads, getting those kids out of their own way, teaching. So my daughter, what else do I do with my daughter is when we have a, a, a fundraiser or an event coming up, guess what? She's there stuffing invitations. She's there doing programs for me. She's there, you know, pretty soon she's going to start working at the galas. And, you know, when I need help dressing my son, she's got to come and she's going to help dress him. She's going to go grab his shoes and, and she's learning how to serve. You know, I, I love, I love hearing you say that because um, as, as you read the gospels and as you read, you know, uh, St. Paul's letters and things like that, you realize that when we live outside of ourselves is when we live a, a freer life and a life uh, that is that is less like um, 
you, you become grateful for the things that you have as you serve others, right? And I always tell young people when they graduate high school, or they graduate college, and they say to me, I'm going to backpack through Europe and go find myself. And I always say to them, if you want to find yourself, go serve somebody, go, go inspire somebody, go do something that's going to lift somebody up out of their, their, uh, their habitat or their, 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 their struggle. It's funny that um, bring that up because I know that uh, you, you touched Kobe Bryant's life. You, you inspired Kobe Bryant. And, and uh, today I saw a quote from Kobe Bryant that said, um, don't live a life that is selfish. Live a life where you're constantly lifting others up and inspiring them. And it was, it was a, a, just on a barber shop uh, chalkboard and it said Kobe Bryant. And I was like, well, that's weird that I'm interviewing Valerie this sure. afternoon. And there's a quote from Kobe Bryant, right? Um, how is it, um, how do you feel when you're able to do, give a van to a, a family that couldn't afford one? How, do, how does it feel to hand those keys over? I was at one of your, um, your galas and there wasn't a dry eye in the house after you and George spoke and, 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 and greeted those families. And I just have to say that you really have taken a, a, a difficult adverse situation and turned it into a huge blessing, not only for yourselves, but for other people around the country. And be selfish for a second and tell me how, how, what kind of joy does that give you? Like doing that work, how can we inspire other people to, that are depressed, that are anxious to get out of it by, I don't want to say pick yourself up by the bootstraps, but to get some sort of inspiration to go do something nice for somebody else and to feel yourself come out of that, um, that lull, that the, the blues, right? Well, and, and that's the only way to do it is, is by, by helping others. There is, first of all, there is always, always somebody worse off than you. <laughs> even in our situation. I mean, we meet fam I meet families every single week and it makes half, most of these families I speak with, it, it makes our life look like, I, I almost feel guilty. Like we are living, I I'm, have my husband, we have a beautiful family. My kids go to a great school. They have friends. We have a great community. We, these, I mean, really these people, I, I meet a lot of single moms. Um, who are trying to do this all on their own and they have a teenage boy that they have to take care of by themselves. I meet Hispanic families, immigrant families that make $30,000 a year and the one parent has to stay home and take care of their son who's my son's age, but their son is so much worse off. He's already on a ventilator. Um, I, I mean, there's always somebody worse off and we have got to get out of victim consciousness. And that victim consciousness is just, again, aside from anxiety is rampant. Victim consciousness is, is, will kill you. And it will just create, it, it, you know, we're not victims here. You know, life happens for us, not to us. And if we go by that belief system, it's happening to me. Why is this happening to me? Let me, what meaning can I make of it? What can I do with that information? now? When we got the diagnosis, I could have buried my head in the sand. I could have, you know, rolled over and said, well, that's it. Life's over. I'm done, you know. And, you know, that what, what life would that be for my kids and myself and my husband? And, you know, I will tell you, the more you serve, the more gratitude you, you live by on a daily basis, God will provide. And I've never thought I'd be, if you told me 10 years ago that I would be in the situation I'm in, have a son with what it has, sitting on a podcast with you talking about this, I wouldn't even believe it. But, you know, it's funny you say that because 35 years ago when we were, you know, teens at, at the camp and stuff, and you, and you would have told me then that I'd be a priest and we'd be talking about something like this, I would have laughed at you as well. Right. Um, but but I, I'm so inspired by your work and the things that you, you do because you can't sit still. You've always been a motivator, a go-getter, doing things. And I really, uh, why don't you tell people your website? Why don't you talk a little bit about Walking Strong and, and uh, how some of the listeners and people that are here can, if they need to find something to help out with, how they can help with Walking Strong? Well, walkingstrong.org is the website. We just redid it. It's really fabulous. We've got a really amazing video, a couple videos on there, uh, our Kobe videos on there, I think, our assistance video, which will show. We also provide service dogs. I mean, we're doing like really cool stuff. Um, Father Gary, your parishioner, one of your parishioners is helping us with the assistance program because I 
honestly, when you're looking, when I talk about walking strong, it's been, you're looking at walking strong over the last, since the pandemic started, it's me, me alone. We haven't had a gala. It's been all me by myself. And it's been, it's been a lot. I will be honest with you because I've also been working. So um, uh, volunteers, you know, I, I, God willing, we're doing a gala in the fall. We will absolutely need volunteers for that. It's an incredible night. Um, so they can go to Valerie at walkingstrong.org and email me anytime. Um, I, we, you know, I, I, if someone owns a printing company and they can print my invitations for low cost or, you know, anything like that, we would love. Somebody loves working with people, then they can help out with our assistance program, which is probably the most rewarding thing that they'll ever do. And talk to these families and try to figure out their needs and how they can be of service. Um, Alex plays on a power soccer team. That is super cool. Um, power soccer. They're like in these, they look like uh, they're electronic chairs with a big cage in the front and they play with gigantic soccer balls in a gym. And it's a league that they play all of our, thank God that's starting up again. That's been again because of COVID down for two years. Um, that's a cool thing. If anyone has teens that want to participate on a, on a, like a Saturday practice and help ref and coach and that that's like a really cool thing for people's teens to get into um there's a lot of ways um you really guys cool. there's a lot of ways yeah I, i'm just thrilled at, at at seeing how um you're able to motivate and get up out of it like you said the easy thing is to bury your head in the sand if you think about it right like that's the easy thing to do the hard thing to do is to sit upright and go okay here we are and to look your husband in the eye and say this is it here we go and then you still have the regular challenges where we started off the show with, you know, you have a teenage daughter. That's a regular life challenge on top of the other things that you have as well. And so how did you turn to God? How did you, how did you find the strength to turn to God? Did, was it, was it Father Bacchus and, and the monk from Mount Sinai that inspired you? Or I mean, probably was, but, but were there other things, other, other ways in which you had motivation to turn to God, to turn to your faith? Yeah. Um, and, and listen, yeah, yeah, it, that that started it, you know, with with that monk. I mean, that that started it. That peaked that peaked my innocence. We we've all grown up in the church our whole lives, you know. I'm a church goer, whatever. But we don't really, you know, being Greek Orthodox, you know, it just becomes habit. It becomes part of a cultural event. It just you don't. It, I mean, it, I'm not criticizing the the Orthodox service. I'm just saying it's it's hard if you, especially you don't speak Greek. It's hard to really get into it. Um, and it's very distracting also because then you've got, you know, you've got, the, you know, the Stephanopoulos is walking down the aisle. Oh, hi, I'll see you after church. Well, you know, so it's, it's not, it's more of a social event. So the meeting the monk certainly planted the seed of, oh my gosh, that was a really spiritual moment. And I actually have peace that I never had before. That was the beginning of it. But I think, and you and I talk about this a lot, you know, going first of all, filling my brain uh, with lots and lots of information that is so powerful. You and I share books, we share podcasts, you know, I, I'm doing that every single day, but meditation has been a life changer for me, an absolute life changer. And um, that is the place and the time where I'm able to settle down my body and um, go inward and really you know, cut away all the distraction and nonsense from the outside world and go inside and really listen to my heart and sort of call in the Holy Spirit and um, pray. You know, the Bible says ceaseless prayer. And you and I talked about that too. And, and you know, it works. I do that all the time. But the first thing I do every morning is really practice um, gratitude. The very first thing I do is and I get out of bed I go and I have a moment, I look out my window and I see the sun rising and I, and I do um, just a moment of just getting still and grounding and thanking God and trying to set an intention for that day. And three things that I'm grateful for is what I prep focus on every morning. That's really awesome. I, I love that too. And you, and you taught me that, and I've been, I've been trying to practice that also. And you see a lot of the beauty in it. When you start your day off with gratitude, um, it's hard for it to go south after that, when you realize what you have and what you're grateful for and the opportunity to see, to hear, to smell, to, to have your senses that way is really a, a great way to start the day and, and be grateful that way. 
Noel, do we have any questions or, or anything? Are people just listening to this uh, to this conversation, or do they have any questions that they want to ask as well? Mostly just listening, but I do have one question, okay. um, which is: Is there anything you did to keep your family integrated after getting the diagnosis? Um, the statistics are pretty bad about families struggling, breaking up, just experiencing tension after a serious diagnosis. So, was there, was there anything that you did to? Um, to just promote family togetherness and, and that sort of uh, strength that you obviously have. Well, you're, you're absolutely right about that. And we know families that have broken up over it, but um, honestly, we got closer. Um, we got closer as a family. We, and we turned, we turned to God. I mean, my kids see me praying a lot. We pray every night at the dinner table together. They see me praying all the time. They know that I meditate. They know that that's my time. My husband does his connection in a different way. Um, he does, he goes more outdoors and goes on a hike and sort of talks to God there. And we're very open in our home talking about that, um, which we weren't before, you know? So that I think brings us together in prayer. You listen, I ask God every day for strength every single day for strength and for guidance and blessing of our family. And may your angels give charge over my children and every single day, ceaseless prayer. And that's what truly works. I love, I love hearing you talk like that, Valerie. And I, 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 I sit back and I, I, I wish that we Orthodox had an alleluia or an amen to give you, you know, like, like uh, some of the fundamentalists do, because that, that was an alleluia moment, moment right there with, just the prayers and just the way that life was. You know, I think back to our youth and how the church provided for us and like gave us like a grounding and a groundwork of support. Um, I'm wondering if there's a, a way in which um, the church now can better serve families, can better serve youth. Um, I know that you said your third phone call was to Father Backus, which is amazing, right? Because I can only imagine who the first two phone calls were to your family, George's family, whatever order. And then the third one went to the church, right? Um, the reason I think that, that that third one went to the church was because you had a solid grounding on, in, in the church life. Like you had a solid foundation knowing that you could turn to the church. And I think that a lot of our youth know that uh, uh, because of youth ministry, right? But can you think of a way that you can educate me as a priest pastorally to have helped you in a, in a way that you needed, like a way that I would have never thought of, uh, like being just looking back on it and saying, Hey, if we would have had somebody doing this, it would have helped on the path a little bit more. Does that question make sense? Well, I think you're saying, is there something more that the, the church can offer the church can do, right. to families that are overcome? Well, yeah. listen, you, you got you priests and I, and I know father bill very well and you very well. And I hear your stories. I mean, you guys are pretty tapped out and everyone sort of, listen, people reach out to, I don't know, whoever's on the listening, these priests are, are, you guys are marriage counselors. <laughs> you are, um, gambling addiction uh, counselors, your your kid counselors, your your you guys wear a lot of hats, and you know your healers and your people reach out to you guys for I'm having hip surgery. I mean, you know, it's there's not enough of you to go around. And I think what would help may, maybe if there was a almost like a a counselor of some type, a, a secondary advisor that um, you know can reach people with their appropriate needs. Um, you know, cause you can't be everything to everyone. You're also a, a father and a husband and you have your own life. So I think you need a team of people honestly under you, like that can sort of be those counselors for those people that are just don't know where else to turn. We have a question uh, here in the chat. Uh, in the in the room that we're in um, with a young lady who's asking about how to stay connected with her local church. Um, she's not able to go because of the COVID cases and stuff like that. How would you advise a young person who's away at school or a young person who lives in, in a community where, um, you know, getting now with COVID and stuff like that, getting physically to church is hard. How would you coach them in getting um, connected to the church and to God uh, in during this time of isolation? Well, this is the time where, listen, you don't have to physically be at a church, you know, in a, in a building with icons to connect to God. And 
there, a, a beautiful place to go connect to God is out in nature. I highly recommend anyone to go to a beautiful place, the beach, a mountain, somewhere like that and connect as well. But, you know, um, fill your brain day and night with, you know, knowledge and read. There are, I mean, you know, as much as I criticize, you know, uh, technology, we are in an information age. So there is no excuse for not um, getting the information that you need on any subject, any topic in the entire world. The good news is you can, I would recommend you should be, you know, listening to fantastic and uplifting inspirational podcasts every single day and reading books that are enlightening you every single day and filling your brain constantly when you're driving on a break, walking, exercising with positive information that lifts you up. And, um, and please don't watch the news. No one should be watching the news (laughs) anymore. Um, shut it off, but yeah, there's plenty of ways to connect. And, you know, of course you can zoom a church service, which is, I know not the same thing, but nature is a, a ground being grounded in nature, bare feet on the bare earth is, is a wonderful way and pray and say your prayers and ask God for, you know, first of all, asking you shall receive, but you know, you also have to, you don't get anything for nothing either. So you really do need to serve in a way, in, in some manner and provide, whether it's even a smile or a, a hug to someone, a stranger, a kind word, a, you know, you, you see someone at a store that's having a really bad day. They seem super stressed out and you stop and pause and ask them how they're doing. And they'll look at you like, oh, someone cares. Wow. And they'll remember that. Okay. Got a, uh, a good friend of ours, uh, Perry Skaggs, who just turned on his video. I'm wondering if he has a question for us. Hi, Perry. Val, how are you? Hi. Wonderful to see you. You look great. You too. Uh, here, uh, here's my thought as I'm listening to Valerie for the hour, uh, which is, I think, a fantastic hour, Father. And you need to tell everybody that's not here live that they need to, uh, that they need to listen to this hour. Uh, and I've seen a lot of your podcasts, and this one is right there at the top. Thank you. Um, Father, it occurred to me that instead of Bible study, which every church does, right? They do Bible study. The kind of things and practices that Valerie's talking about, these these life skills and how to, you know, uh, appreciate and have gratitude, I think that a lot of parishioners and and people that go to church would benefit from something like that far more than they would with study of Scripture. Not that study of Scripture is not great. But in today's day and time, if yes. you're looking to service the needs of your congregation, yes. just providing, you know, the study of Scripture ain't going to get it done. Uh, and having something like that, and even having something like Valerie was talking about earlier, classes where parents can come and learn how to turn off the Internet, learn how to turn off social media, learn how to say no, learn how to take the phone, learn how to manage that, because parents are struggling. They're struggling on how to do that. And uh, if our faith can somehow tap into that and make that a priority, and it doesn't have to be the priests that do that, you can bring in other people uh, that each community can start with those classes, you know, once a week somewhere um, with two people, three people, and then go from there. You know, my philosophy, just do it and then, you know, let people come. I think it would be a tremendous service that we could do to uh, all Orthodox Christians that are, that are, that are in our, in our parishes. Which I'm going to, I'm going to uh, disagree with you, but agree with you in the end and tell you that, uh, that, that you can teach, you can teach those things with scripture and, and enhance it with an understanding of scripture, right? Like, like scripture is, is more than enough, but, but I, I get the point that you're making. I'm not, that's why I'm, I'm disagreeing and agreeing with you because we're right on the same page. A thought that I've had recently, uh, Perry and Valerie, that, and I know Father Sotiris is on as well. He's a, he's a schoolmate and a great priest as well. Uh, something that we always say all the time as clergy and as, as Christians is God tells us to love God with all of our mind, with all of our heart, and with all of our soul, and to love our neighbor as we, we would ourselves, right? We, we focus on the first two aspects of that, of that equation, love God and love your neighbor, but the love your neighbor part is, is also about how to love yourself, right? And I think that we fail to teach people how to love yourself. 
And, and I think that, that well, as you were saying that, Perry, that these are skills that kids need to learn. Like, how do you love yourself? How are you your own best friend? How, how can we be our own worst enemy as well, right? And, and how can the church teach us to lift ourselves out of that and to do um, better things? And I think that, that all the things that Valerie's saying, all the things that you're saying are really life skills that, that we could learn if we apply ourselves to the discipline of, of growing from it and, and doing it. And, and you're, you've always been that voice of reason, to me at least, as a coach and, 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 the, and the friend, where how does it apply? How do we make it applicable, right? And that's one of the reasons why I think that I'm enjoying this hour with Valerie, and I think we might have to do a second hour because we're, we're coming up on the end here. But Valerie, I think that you've applied to these things. I, I think that what Perry is saying is that how do you, how, how do we apply these things? And I'm watching you, Valerie. Um, really, I'm, I'm close to tears right now because um, I have a friend who lost his wife, uh, a, a priest friend whose wife died at a young age. Um, we all know, we all remember Chrissy Kiriazis. Uh, uh, now, she, Presbyteta Chrissy Flosaurus, uh, when she passed away, she passed away at the age of like 41, 42, right? And I remember sitting with Chris and Father Chris, sorry, and watching him laugh. And I looked at him and said, God, man, God bless you. I don't know if I'd be able to do it. And you know what his response to me was? And I felt like such a fool. He said, Gary, I didn't have a choice. I had to, right? Like you didn't have a choice, Valerie. Like you, you had, you got, your choice was bury your head in the sand or apply what you've learned and go forward and be grateful and, and, and thank God and to fill your time with, with the things that are there. And I think that that's what our people need to see is, is the way that we apply this to our lives. How does it apply? And I want to applaud you, uh, Perry, for, for saying that and for putting that challenge out there and dropping the gauntlet like that, because I think it's important. And Valerie, um, I just want to thank you for being such a great example of a, a great mother, a great wife, um, and a great friend, and um, just, a, just an inspirational person who... Um, doesn't stop doing. I mean, you're you're producing. You're 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 making you're making great content. I mean, there's things that we're going to watch on Netflix in the theater coming up that is going to have your name on it, and uh, and you're doing it. And we really appreciate your time here. I want to give you the last couple minutes to um, wrap up and uh, uh, share any other last thoughts that you have, and then Noel is going to take us out and um, close up the show. Valerie, it's been a great hour, and I seriously putting the invitation out there to do this one more time because well, there's so much more that we can we can. The only thing on. I'm going to say is, Perry, I agree with you one thousand thousand percent. I think the antiquated Bible study days are uh, for a certain crowd um, and and not our age group. Um, I I think that the church should absolutely sort of become more culturally relevant and. Uh, work on doing these things regularly to reach out to parents that everyone struggled. Perry, you're a teacher, you, you're a coach. Yep. You see what's going on firsthand yep. every single day with these kids. And um, we have got to, that's why I keep telling Father Gary, we've got to do something. I mean, the, and this is the beginning. This is how we start. So I think we should do some type of a regular, I will talk anywhere, you guys. I will no, Zoom, I will go in person. I will, you know, whatever it takes. Um, because these kids are are struggling, and and we've got to we've got to help save them. I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Valerie. Thank you for being here, Perry. Uh, you've been uh, ninety five percent of the shows. I really appreciate your time uh, being here. And Father Sotiri, I, I see. I'm waiting for the day that you turn your video on as well, so we can say hi to you. And uh, to all everyone else here and listening, thank you. And uh, Noel, go ahead and take us out and uh, do the business. And Valerie, my heart felt gratitude. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a great conversation. Thank for you. Sharing. Uh, well, thank you to everyone who's joining us today. Thank you for all of you here on Zoom and on our social media. And um, I am putting the link to um, to all of the things that Valerie mentioned on our social media. So, and I'll also update our myocn.net page. If you want to learn more about her organization and the resources that you heard about, please check that out. We'll also have the video up on the webpage. Um, if you're not signed up for a newsletter, please do sign up for that and membership to my OCN community, which is always free. And you'll be the first to hear about upcoming events and new resources. Um, upcoming events this week, just to keep it short, we have our Thursday Let's Talk Live program as usual. We're bringing back Father Nicholas Lowe, who will be talking about his book, 
Renewing You, a Priest, a Psychologist, and a Plan, and we'll be talking about Renewing Your Purpose, which is part three, I believe, in that series. And then we also have our Sunday uh, morning adult education with Michael Haldes and also our Sunday Bible study from Ascension Cathedral. And then we will be back next week, every Tuesday, Armed with Faith. So please join us again.